All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Now, I said guys because I feel like I should only be talking to the guys today. Because, <laughs> Kevin, when we look at Proverbs 5, all right, and you begin to look at all the, the titles over each chapter, eh, this topic, when you get into it, it says, avoid seduction. And you're kind of like, ah, oh, Kevin, what, what book of the Bible makes you think of this now? Uh, normally, Song of Solomon. And... Even then, we get to get into Leviticus. It's like all these details, like, am I afraid of it? No, but it's really graphic. So I, just, I have no problem telling you today, what we're going to be talking about is an extremely sensitive issue. Uh, and I say sensitive because it feels like half of America has been entrenched in Proverbs 5. And dare I even say, even some in the church. And this message today is by no means finger pointing of people that have gone through this. By no means am I condemning people or slamming people. I'm just going to walk through Proverbs 5 of right where you're at today. Does that make sense? Is that fair? So like if you've gone through a whole lot of junk and God has set you free and healed you, walk in that freedom, please. But my prayer is, is that this uses and serves as a preventative to choose the right path. Let wisdom speak into your life from above so that you can practically say, I want that path, not that path. And so when you see the title, Avoid Seduction, you should really understand this chapter is going to be about sex. This chapter is going to be about a temptation that literally is going to just dangle in front of you. And I want to make sure everybody understands. And I like what Warren Wiersbe says, God invented sex. And he has every right to tell us how to use it. This is God's design of how people can actually, what, have children, <laughs> to have pleasure, to have enjoyment, to become one. And Satan wants to come in and take what God intended for good and try to bring about destruction in marriages, in relationships, in families. And it's because of seduction. And I want to do everything we can right now to make sure everybody is warned it's out there. Because here's what happens, and I like what Wearsby says, sexual sins, uh, they're disappointing. Eventually, they're destructive, and it can lead to deadly. They're disappointing, they're destructive, and they're deadly. And you're going to see that in Proverbs 5, Proverbs 6, and Proverbs 7. So in verse 1, what I like what Solomon says is, he says, my son Pay attention to my wisdom. So what you're going to see in the very first six verses is he writes about the danger of seduction. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen closely to my understanding so that you may maintain discretion and your lips safeguard knowledge. Interesting enough, there's this image already in verse two of these, this lips of youth. Like this is the image. He's talking to a younger one, this lips of youth, because he says in verse three, though the lips of the forbidden women, woman drip honey and her words are smoother than oil. So he's doing this weird comparison of the lips of youth who don't know much. Remember, we talked about this, the simple, the naive, and even the innocent, you guys. But when they're, they're in front of this, this attractive woman who it looks like her lips are, and I know it's a, an interesting image, dripping with honey and her words are smoother than oil. Everything looks right about this person. Like everything looks good. And it really is, it's like this Satan luring you away, you guys, from the path. He's luring you away and he, he wants to take you down this path. And Solomon's writing to her son, look, just because it looks good. And it looks attractive and it looks sexy and all of these things that you think Satan just uses that as a mask because in verse four, look what happens. It says, in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a double edged sword. So what looks good is just really a mask. It's really a front. And the reality is, is what that person brings to the table Satan uses. It's just bitter and it's sharp and it actually hurts. Because you see what's interesting, if the words are swallowed from this woman, right? Because we talked about this, how it drips, right? Her lips drip with honey and her words are smoother than the oil. If you actually swallow her words, Constable says, it actually hurts then. Because it's as sharp as a double-edged sword. But nobody thinks about 
the consequences of receiving the words. Nobody thinks about uh, the, the, the results of participating in with the seduction. We just want to participate. Like, that's the challenge that Satan knows about every single person, man or woman. And don't just think, you guys, I know there's this image of a woman, but I really believe women give in to the seduction of men just as much as men give in to the seduction of women. It's, it's really a both and. So in your mind, you have this picture, but I'm speaking to both genders here. It says in verse five, watch the scripture. It says her feet. Okay, this is the woman, this forbidden woman. It says her feet go down to death. Her steps head straight for Sheol. In other words, this seductive woman will lead you straight to death. There's a danger here that we need to be aware of. And it says this in verse six. She doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't know that her ways are unstable. She only wants this seductress woman only wants, you ready for this? Physical and an emotional and what Constable says, a thrill. Just quick, a quick fix, a quick pleasure. That's really what the flesh is about. Just give me something that feels good. It will take away, you ready for this? All of my pain. It will take away maybe a marriage that's not going so well. It'll take away, you know, maybe my kids aren't going well or my job is not going well. If I can just dance and flirt a little bit over here with this seduction situation, I'll feel better. But that whole process, you guys, is that it leads to a whole lot more. And that's what people don't realize. That's why our society is completely screwed up, is that nobody thinks about the consequences of the pleasures. They don't care if your life leads to destruction after this. And so what happens is in verses 7 through 14, I want to talk about the price of unfaithfulness. There's a price for unfaithfulness. And it says in verse 7, so now my sons, interesting enough, Kevin in verse one, he was just talking to his son. Now in verse seven, he's increasing his audience. He says, now my sons, listen to me and don't turn away from the words of my mouth. This seduction thing is, is real. <laughs> Scripture says in verse eight, um, keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door. Don't go near the door of her house. I think this is an interesting statement. Temptations in general are actually unavoidable. Uh, I, I think there's temptations all around us. I, I think we drive down a highway. <laughs> there's billboards galore. You interact with people out on the street. There's temptations. There's temptations everywhere. You guys. Whatever, whatever is a temptation, it's really there. But you cannot put yourself in an environment where you're walking towards that environment. Like you're walking towards that next step. Because in Genesis 4, 7, if you want to go to this text, Kevin, I think this is really interesting. In Genesis 4, 7, it says this. If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, look at this. Sin is crouching at the door. It's desires for you, but you must rule over it. In other words, you actually, I, I, you have a choice. It bothers me, you guys, in society and even in the church when they say, oh, this is how I was made. This is how I was designed or it's a generational thing. And so I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. I hear that all the time out doing ministry. No, 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 you can. You allow the wisdom of Christ to help you. You allow the Spirit of God to help you. It is a choice that you decide to go that way. And he tells his sons, you keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. And I love this because Paul says the same thing, you guys, to Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, 22. Paul says the same thing. In fact, if you didn't know that this was the book of uh, Proverbs, this could be the, the book of Timothy right here. Flee from youthful passions, Timothy. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I need you, Timothy, to flee from the lusts that are in front of you. Like, don't go near the door. It's literally the Joseph situation, you guys. It's, what is it, Pharaoh's wife? Is that right? She tries to seduce him, and what does he do? He runs. I just think what's happening is, is that men and women are isolating themselves so much so that nobody knows what's even going on that they're around the door. 
Like I should know, Kevin, you should know, Rich, you should know. You, you guys should actually have the freedom and the liberty to speak into my life at any time. You know, I'm kind of concerned about that, Kyle. Or I see something, but if you're not around people that can speak into your life, then hey, I can go to any door I want, right? That's the reality of what it is. I've always loved what Billy Graham did. I love that uh, Billy always had somebody with him. Now, some people have given Billy a hard time because he should be a man of God and he shouldn't have to have that person. Look, temptations are everywhere. And if you want to be a person that doesn't want to fall, it's OK to have accountability. It's OK to have a Paul saying, hey, Timothy, don't do this. And I like this, that Paul speaks into Timothy. Solomon speaks into his sons. Please do not go near the door. MacArthur says the price of unfaithfulness is so high, it is unreasonable. So it's wide to avoid tempting himself to even put yourself to admire. I hope you hear this in an OK way to admire the merchandise. Don't go shopping. Don't go window shopping and looking for how can I get in? Because that is when infidelity happens, because you continue to spend time in front of the door, in front of the window. You do whatever it takes, you guys. You do whatever it takes to remove those doors. Just so you see this verse six, I want to read something. She doesn't consider the path of life. She doesn't care about how her ways are unstable. And so when she invites you into the door, she's taking what God designed as good and bringing destruction to it. Sex is actually a good thing. Sex is actually designed by God. In fact, Warren Wiersbe says, God created sex not only for reproduction, but also for enjoyment. And he didn't put the marriage wall around sex to rob us of pleasure, but to increase pleasure and to protect it. I love that perspective, but so many of us think, what do you mean I can't have sex until I'm married? And so then all of a sudden it's like, there's doors everywhere. But it goes back to Proverbs, you guys, when we talked about this, when you learn God's truth and you obey his will, what happens? You can walk a path that he's designed. But if all of a sudden you don't like this path, you don't like the truth, you're going to go this direction because the door is always open for this path. It's always there. Which is why the father says to the sons, do not go near that door. If you know there's a door that's trouble, tell your spouse. If you know that there's a door that's trouble, tell your coworker. If you know that there's a door that's trouble, tell your sister, tell your brother, tell somebody. Because eventually it will catch up with you. And that's what it says in verse nine. Otherwise, you'll give up your vitality to others and your years to someone cruel. In other words, you literally lose your powers and, are you ready for this? You're exploited. And in fact, in verse 10, because of this unfaithfulness, it even says you can get blackmailed. Strangers will drain your resources and your earnings will end up in a foreigner's house. Yeah, but I just wanted to have sex with somebody else. Like that's the thought. Nobody will ever catch me. That's the process that in the mind that they're thinking And the scripture says, oh, it will catch up with you and you might lose everything. I mean, you look at uh, the divorces that are across America. And, you know, you talk about some of the wealthiest beings literally in the world. Somebody just got divorced. I'm not even going to go down names. He's going to lose half of his stuff. He's a mess. It says in verse 11, here's what's going to happen. At the end of your life, you will lament when your physical body has been consumed. In fact, there can lead to the price of unfaithfulness. Yeah, you're going to lose your resources. Yeah, you could be exploited. Everybody could know about what takes place. Hmm. You could actually get a physical disease. Verse 12, it says this, and you will say how I hated discipline and how my heart despised correction. And the price of unfaithfulness, you know what that means? You'll even hate yourself in this process. And I didn't obey my teachers or listen closely to my mentors. So now they're going to think through this, all of this. That, Gosh, why didn't I do this? I am on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. There's so much with this price of unfaithfulness. And can I just say, all of your kids that fall under this, if you have kids, they're completely, they have to deal with your mess. Look, again, you have to understand something. Some of you have gone through some horrific stuff. Some of you have been a, a, a product, a victim of your spouse giving into seduction. I don't know what your scenario is. All I'm just saying is today, right now, please don't go near the doors because if you do, 
There is a whole lot that you have to deal with just because you decided to have five minutes of quick pleasure. Which is why in verses, really, in verses uh, 15 through 23, Constable says this. The, um, he talks about the importance of... So let's paint a really fun picture now, the importance of fidelity. In verse 15, this is really interesting. It says this, Drink water from your own cistern, water flowing from your own well. Should your springs flow in the street, streams of water in the public squares, they should be for you alone and not for you to share with strangers. Look, there's no other way around this. This is super um, detailed and super graphic, okay? Uh, the, the water is just, it's literally a reference to sexual union. It's a reference to man and woman actually having sexual intercourse, and it's designed for husband and wife and nobody else. You're not to share sexual intimacy with strangers. You don't hire a prostitute. You don't hire an individual, a sex slave, to go through this process. You don't do that. I'm saying these things because, guys, it's rampant in our society. Like, this isn't some, like, isolated incident. It's across America. Verse 18, it says, Let your fountain be blessed and take pleasure in the wife of your youth. Take pleasure, you guys, with the wife that he's given you. You know, my wife and I have been married uh, going on 18 years. That was for you, Laura, because I always say 17 years. She always says we're going on the next year. Uh, you know, one wife. That's how he's designed it. I don't care if your marriage is hard right now. You, you stick it out. I don't care if things aren't the best. Guess what? You work this process out. And it might mean you trust God, you get on your face, you think about Him, and you say, God, I need help in this marriage. You say, wow, Kyle, I've done all that. I'm, I'm just telling you how God has designed this process. You take pleasure in your wife and nobody else. In verse 19, it just says this, and this is how you take pleasure in her. It says, a loving doe, a graceful fawn. Let her breasts always satisfy you. Be lost in her love forever. I'm actually going to hang out here for a second because here's, here's what I think happens. In marriages, I think, and I've seen this, people get tired of their spouse. They think that there's somebody else better somewhere else. And he says, no, no, let her breast, let her body satisfy you. You be lost in her love forever. And there's not another option. I mean, it really is this erotic language, as Constable says, it's unusual. But he's saying, you guys, I've designed it so that you could enjoy each other. And if you actually lived the way that God designed your marriage, you wouldn't need to go out to the public squares. You wouldn't need to go somewhere else. I love this image of lost in her love forever. He says in verse 20, My son, why, why would you be infatuated with a forbidden woman or embrace the breast of another stranger if you understood verse 19? Verse 20 is not even an option. The doors aren't even there if you're literally hanging on to your wife's body. Embrace her love forever and then nobody else exists. And I hope you hear that in, in the right way. And to me, this is the perspective. This is wisdom, you guys. This is wisdom in your marriage and in your sex life. You want to work through your sex life, <laughs> fall in love with your, your wife. You can say, well, Kyle, there's a different scenario. Yeah, yeah, you could come all this. But once those scenarios start happening, you guys, verse 20 starts taking place. You begin thinking about somebody else. You begin thinking about, hey, what would this look like? And then marriages just do this, and it's a domino effect, and I'm tired of it. I want to go to, uh, I want to hang out here in verse 20 for a second. It just says, would you be infatuated? That word infatuated, it actually means ravished. Like, why would you be infatuated? Why would you be ravished, okay, with, with somebody else? In other words, here's what it looks like, okay? This is a crazy picture that Warren Wiersbe says. An adulterer watches a, a river turn into sewer. A faithful husband sees water, and it turns into wine. And he says in verse 21, For a man's ways are before the Lord's eyes. <laughs> you know what that means? You can't get away with any secret sexual sin. You can't hide. He knows everything 
you look at. Open up your phone. Show your kids what you look at. Open up your phone. You sh show your wife. Open up your computer and then show it to everybody in the congregation because God says, I already know what's on all of that stuff. I already know your map plan as you drive through work and maybe you take a different route. I, I don't know. I just know that God knows everything and he sees everything. And yet for some reason, we think that when we're in this dark little path, the light's not going to shine. I'm telling you, the importance of, of fidelity, the importance of, of a man and woman, you guys, it prevents you from dealing with all of the unfaithfulness. And can I just tell you, all, you know what all this comes down to? Selfishness. I don't care how you phrase it. If you get seduced into a situation, it's because you think you want something better and you're not thinking about anybody else except yourself. Verse 22, it says this, a wicked man's iniquities entrap him. He's entangled in the ropes of his own, look at that, his own sin, which means he put himself in this environment. It's like he went from bond, it's like he went from freedom to, to, to bondage. He becomes a slave to his own sin. Kevin, can you go to John 8, verse 34 for me, please? He says this, uh, I assure you, this is Jesus talking, everybody who commits sin is a slave of sin. When you start hanging out in this seduction world and it leads to unfaithfulness, i just, just tell you, what happens is you become a slave to sin. And a lot of times people don't know how to get out of it. In fact, it says in verse 23, he will die because there's no discipline. He's so stuck in the trap, in the hole, in the pit. It says he becomes lost because of his great, look at this, his stupidity. <laughs> so you want to know what happens if you do this? Can I just say you become stupid? Because you're stuck on yourself. You can say, well, thanks for the great encouragement, Kyle. Because I'm there. I'm, I'm in this environment. You're calling me stupid. Yeah, but I just want to tell you, Christ is in the business of getting people out of the hole. Christ is in the business of setting people free. No matter how far gone you are, a year, a two years, five years of emotional affair, a physical affair, a one night fling, whatever the situation is, your stupidity is not too big that God can't fix. God truly was. Jesus truly wants to set you free. It's the wisdom that he wants to pour into you. But you know what it is? You have to admit, I'm here and I don't want to be here. I need to be over here. Jesus, I need you. So there's a warning and it's a clear warning. You stay away. Proverbs 5, 8 says, you stay away, what? From this door. You stay away from the seduction. Don't go near the door. And in fact, do whatever you can to burn the door. Throw away all your phones, get new numbers, get new emails. I don't care what it is, you guys. You are never too far gone that God can't restore and redeem any situation. Look, here's the reality. <laughs> Jesus truly says he died for everybody. And because he died for everybody, it means that he's in the business of setting people free. When you surrender your life, I don't even care if you're in the hole feeling stupid. Surrender your life to him and he says, thanks, now I can help you. And I have to tell you though, like, there's a lot of ways. <laughs> I wanted to go down different paths. We could take the path of salvation. We could take the path of redemption. I want to just, I just, I feel like this is where I'm at right now. I wrote a phrase, fight for your marriage. That's what I wrote today. Some of you are going through some stuff. It's not your choice what your spouse is going to do. And you're like, Kyle, I've been fighting. I've been trying. Praise the Lord. And I would just say until it is finally done and you see paperwork, I'm just going to tell you, fight. And here's how I want to just say you fight from this. First of all, Dave Wills says this. You take a break from being negative and critical and sarcastic about the other person. Can I just say that? Like, I don't care what they've done to you. Just stop with the negativity. Just stop. Like, it's really easy to say, do you know what they did to me? Do you understand what a jerk that guy is? Do you know how much money he took from me? Do you know? Whatever it is, just you got to come to a point 
even in the hole, stop. And then in this process, you got to, <laughs> this is super obvious, you got to find something that you actually like about that person. Just one thing. I don't care. Maybe they put the toilet paper the right way. Like maybe they fold towels. Maybe, maybe it's like you like how they sit on a chair and chew their food. I'm serious. I don't care what the one thing is that you like. Find one thing and focus on that because here's the deal. You know what happens? The reason you get into the seduction mode is, is you think that the other person that you're walking away from, they're no good. There's nothing good in them. Ask the Lord. And you're like, I'm not asking the Lord. You're probably not. So I would just say, figure out one thing. Well, maybe you, maybe you like her lipstick today. Quit with the negativity and just think of one thing that you like about your spouse. And then in this process, can I just tell you, you have to surround yourself with some kind of support system. You have to. I don't care if it's a best friend. I don't care if it's a pastor. I don't care if it's a coworker. But it better be somebody that's breathing godly counsel and wisdom into your life. Because if you surround yourself with somebody that just keeps saying, yeah, you know what, you should leave or hey, by the way, this is what I did. And now here's how I'm going to like surround yourself with godly support. And then can I just tell you the biggest game changer? The biggest game changer in any marriage of any person that's fighting, even if your marriage is good, you start praying with your spouse. I don't care if that spouse doesn't want to pray with you, but they'll sit there and listen. You pray every day. Pray, pray. And then I'm just going to add another one. It's not on Dave Willis's deal here. You know what I do? And you can laugh all you want. I try every single day to pick up my wife, Laura. Just, I literally, it's almost like that old school, like carrying across the threshold. I don't carry across the threshold. It's just, I want my kids to see I love my wife. I want them to see physically we're connected. But you got to stop the negativity. You got to find one thing that you like about this person. Surround yourself with the support. And then just say, hey, can we just start praying? And, just see what God does. Because when you do all of that, you know what happens? You, you close the door, you guys, on this. Like it's gone. The seduction, the unfaithfulness, all of that, it, it's gone. And the focus goes back to Him. You know, I, I have a whole list of ways that we can overcome the adultery thing. I have things of even the love dares. If you guys are familiar with love dares, if you guys are struggling in your marriage and you're, you're dealing with all of this issue, can I just, it's a 40 day challenge. And it is the smallest stuff, but I'm telling you, do it. It will force you to get back into keeping your eyes on your spouse and keeping yourself away from the door. Look, there's so much here. But I'll tell you this, um, marriage is an absolute beautiful thing. Why? Because it actually reflects Christ as He serves and leads the body of Christ. Marriage is to reflect Him which is why I love this chapter. It always goes back to how can we reflect Christ. All right, guys, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.